Hey everybody, welcome to episode 134. Um, Alright, let's dig into scripts, storytelling, um, specifically when it comes to comics. So, I did a little bit of notes this last week and I kind of thought about it as I was writing a script, a couple of scripts for some new comics I've got going. And, uh, you know, I was reading some in the book, uh, in that book I got here. And, you know, I'll, I'll talk about some of the things that this guy mentions. This is, uh, who, who writes this? Uh, Al Mc, Alan McKenzie is the writer of that book. It, of course, there's the uh, comic strips. How to run sell comic strips for newspapers and comic books. And, again, this book was written, or was published, I don't know if it was written, but it was published in 1987. So, it's it's... It's an old book, but the stuff that he says in it, it's odd, too, because, and I bought this book in 1987, and the things that he's talking about in this book, uh, it kind of, uh, it got, you know, in the 90s and stuff with the image, you know, the big image boom coming out of Marvel and the speculator bubble and all that stuff, all of, like, the, the worst or sometimes, the, I mean, some stuff was good, but I mean, a lot of the stuff that he was lamenting about in this book at the time for comic books, it was it was thrown out the window, pretty much. Um, and what I'm referring to is, he makes a statement in this book, he says that, uh, let me see if I can quote it verbatim, uh, if there's any single single thing, this first sentence, and the, the uh, chapter on story, <clears throat> he says, uh, if there's any single thing wrong with comic books, it's the lack of good scripts. I agree with that. This has been a problem throughout the history of comic of the comic strip, particularly in comic books. I agree with that. It seems that scripts has always been take has always taken a back seat to the art. It's a visual medium, so you kind of you know in in the visual cell, so it's kind of uh, you know catch-22 with that. Um, says, perhaps this is because the script is the one invisible component of any comic strip. <clears throat> Anyone can tell at a glance whether a comic strip is well drawn or not. That's true. I mean, you pick up any comic, you know, oh, the art looks like crap, or the art looks awesome. <clears throat> but uh, to discern whether the script is any good takes a lot more skill. Um, I agree with that for the most part. But here's the thing: you don't have to be a literary genius, or you don't have to be a, a you know an English major, you know, to uh, to point out a good story and a bad story. Um, to you, as the reader, and I'm assuming the purchaser of the of the the book of the comic. Um, do you like it? That's the question you ask yourself. Do you do you honestly like it? You, you don't, not what somebody else thinks, don't go on YouTube, you know, after you read a comic, you know, or a movie or whatever, and see what the peanut gallery is talking about, you know, and, and so you can, you know, because you can't make up your own opinion, so you need somebody else to validate it for you. Don't do that. <laughs> um, do you like the comic? If you you know if you buy a comic that looks interesting, you like the art, you like the characters, you kind of might know you might know vaguely what it's about. Um, but you read the comic or the graphic novel or whatever, um, or the page. It could just be a strip, a comic strip, you know, or one page, three panels, whatever. <clears throat> Do you like it? Is it worth purchasing? Is it worth your time? to pay attention to it, right? That's what you gotta ask yourself. If the question is yes, then the person who, the creator is not just the artist, but the storyteller himself, whether it's the artist who wrote it, or it's a specific writer or whatever, they did their job. Um, you know, do you don't do you not like it? Do you like? I'm, I'm not. I'm not going to buy that. Or I, I, I'm not going to waste my time even finish reading that. I, you know, I couldn't even get through the first page. They failed, right? Here's the thing: it's all subjective. So, the, the artist them or the the writer themselves could think think, oh, I've got you know a, a prize winning, you know a uh, an Eisner award winning comic script here, right? That's what he thinks in his mind, you know. And then it doesn't sell. Nobody buys it. Falls flat. The series is canceled. Um, apparently, he was uh, either delusional. 
which was probably more likely the case, or he uh, he was wrong. You know, he made a, he he was he he thought it was good and it wasn't. So you know, I, I can go for the art too. You know, a, a lot of a lot of times I feel that people. Um, I don't know how the, what the actual word for it is, but they, they're impressed by their own uh, work, meaning they, uh, they're not really impressed by the work itself. They're impressed that they completed the work or that they come up with something, you know, hey, I wrote a comic book script, you know, and, uh, and I'm, you know, I think it's good be just because the simple fact is I, I completed it, you know, I did it. And uh, they just assume, I like it. I put the stuff that I like into the script. Therefore, why doesn't anybody else like it? You know, I guess it, it comes down to your personal tastes. Not just your creativity, but your tastes, more likely. What you like. I mean, you could, you know, you could have the chops. You could have the technical ability to write a really good story or a really good script. But your personal tastes are so you're tone deaf to what people actually want. Um, I find I have that issue myself sometimes when I get real self-indulgent and I go off into the weeds. Um, you know, sometimes I, I think to myself, you know, my personal tastes might get really out there. Um, and there's a, only a handful or very small minority of people, you know, that appreciate it, or if not none. Um, and that's the problem. I mean, at the end of the day, Hopefully, well, not hopefully, but I mean, if you're doing this for a hobby or if you're doing this just for the love of the art, you know, then that's fine, right? Do whatever you want to do. But like me, if you're doing it to, you know, put food on the table and put a roof over your head, you know, you're going to probably want to sell it. And, you know, at the end of the day, if you get so self-indulgent and you get so, you know, into your own, you know, it's basically up your own ass about it, you're going to... Uh, you're going to turn people off probably most likely unless they're you know they like uh, they like what you come you know they like all of your sensibilities which is usually never the case then you know people are going to not purchase it and you're going to start losing money and therefore no food on the table and the roof over the head uh, ceases to exist so um, so that's kind of like what I'm throwing out there what I mean by it is is you're writing a story for an audience you a you got to know your audience you know if you're writing military history and you know and your audience isn't there you know your audience wants you know uh, whatever uh, romance comedies you're probably not gonna sell you know much to your audience so you got to know your audience and obviously you know your audience if you've done this for a while and you've been on social media and on the platforms for a while, you've built probably a following. And that's the number one thing you need to do if you're going to sell comics or anything online, whether it's art, anything. But in this, let's just narrow it down to comics. If you're going to sell comics online, you know, digital comics, web comics, hard copies, whatever, you're going to have to uh, create some buzz. And you're gonna have to have a following of people that like your whatever you're putting out. And the only way to do that's over time. And the only way to do it's to start doing it. Uh, you got to start with the first, you know, whatever it is. You got to start with the first comic strip, you know, gag panel page, whatever book, short story. You know, maybe it's your art. You know, with me, I started out cultivating a following on DeviantArt through simply just my art, but my art always had a, a storytelling element to it. Um, so I, you know, I base I've been I've done comics before, and I figured, okay, let's slowly kind of of you know bring the comic thing back in and see what happens here. And I started out with simple, you know, one panel gags, you know, like editorial gag, uh, you know strips then maybe then I went to two panel strips then I went to three panel strips then basically then I went to a, a full you know four to six panel page um, one strip and then I went to three panel pages or three pages comics I worked my way up I'm starting to scale down I found that a probably a a perfect for online and if you're selling specifically you know like a subscription service I'm like 
Patreon or Deviant or wherever your or your web comic is, you can have this long narrative, this really long, long, long narrative. That's fine if you've got the following and the people are digging your stuff. And if you want to make money at it, you're being successful at it. But to get to that point, it's going to take a very long time. And I don't think I'm there yet either. Um, the problem is, is because, again, if you get too self-indulgent or if you take the story in a certain direction and you start losing people, right, you're going to have to steer the ship. You're going to have to right the ship back on course. And if you can't afford to lose one person, let alone 100 people, um, then I wouldn't take on a large... Uh, a large you know body work that's very time consuming takes all your time pretty much you know you're doing a 20 page plus comic book with uh you know at eight eight hours a page you know you're looking at a pretty long endeavor um and if you need to you know make rent that month you might not want to you know embark on that unless you have a pretty steady following that's you know that's in some money coming and do that so what i suggest is maybe not go for like the one pagers or like the single gags unless you're really into that. I would say a good, and I'm 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 bringing my stuff back into this kind of format too. Is a three-page comic with you know I wouldn't do more than six pa six panels a page. It depends on the way you you do your layouts. Um, I take the approach of the more classic Marvel way of doing like the Jack Kirby six-panel tier. Um, and I'll explain what that is. Uh, you know, the more the British way, the DC way, you know, especially with people like, uh, you know, like Miller and, um, uh, you know, like the, who the, who the, the big hitters, um, uh, what's his name? Uh, Alan Moore, those guys, they like to do that nine panel grid. I mean, the entire Dark Knight comic book is basically built on the nine panel grid. I don't like the nine panel grid because I don't like those small panels. Um, I like my stuff to breathe and be a little more open. Um, and I like to, so I like a little more in the shot. So I'll do, um, I work on the six panel grid, which is just look at any classic Marvel comic book and you'll see the six panels, right? This That's the grid. So you could either have a horizontal panel on top and then four, so you get five panels in the page, three horizontals, three panels. Um, sometimes they break it up into a... I don't like the, the the four equal panels. They use it a lot, but I don't really like it. I don't like that format. Um, I like a lot of the wide panels. Uh, so I usually go in a wide panel, maybe a couple of squares, you know, maybe offset a bit, and then a wide panel on the bottom. Or you know four squares on the bottom, or four squares on top, wide on the bottom. You know what I mean? You basically play with that six panel, six equal squares, and break that up however you want. Maybe you want to take the top two panels, and you want to make more of a, you know, more of a rectangle with the first panel, and then more of a thinner panel on that other one. Right? You can just move it, move that panel over. Um, so that's how I kind of work. And if so, I like I said, I say up to six panels a page. And if you're doing three pages, 18 panels, um, you know, and that's a good, basically, like, if you listen to anybody who talks about how to submit, like, a samples for a comic book publisher, everybody says, give it your best three pages. You can tell a, a an incident or, or a, a scenario situation in three pages with no subplots. Um, and that's what you know the publishers want to see is your ability to tell those three pages and if you can if you've got the the hook in there whether you're the artist or you're the writer write those three pages so the same thing I'm saying with when you're trying to hook people into following your stuff hit them with three page hit them with a three page story or a three page you know scenario and then if it doesn't if it doesn't if it falls flat and it doesn't land you can always you're only invested into three pages, then start another three pages, right? Um, and then people, like, if they want to see multiple characters or multiple things going on, like, my people like to see a lot of different characters, and they like to see some reoccurring characters come back. And like I said, if, you, if you've committed yourself to 20 pages of, say, four different characters, and people get tired of those characters, and they want to see, like, hey, you know, you did this character... Previously, I want to see that character again. Well, I'm not going to be getting to that anytime soon because I have 
uh, you know, I've got, uh, I've got 18 more pages to go or whatever, right? But if you hit them with the three pages, they know, oh, it's probably going to, you're going to shift in the next three pages. You're going to come up with some new characters. Maybe you want a character will carry over, who knows? Um, but, and also the thing is, they, it says in this book specifically, and it does in other books too, uh, don't, there, you can, there's no room for subplots in three pages. Subplots take at least 12 pages. I agree with that. Um, I sometimes, I was putting small subplots in my stuff, and I realized that that doesn't, sometimes I forget the subplot, and then when I go to the next few pages, I kind of, or the next story, I kind of forgot what the subplot was, or the subplot wasn't going anywhere. It just didn't pan out. So I would avoid the subplots. Um, I would tell an incident, a, a short, concise in incident. Um, and I would probably use a small cast, you know, a small uh, set of characters if you're going to do three pages. I would probably say no more than three characters, maybe like, uh, you know, say Batman and Robin versus the Joker, right? Or, um, there's an example, and I'll show you here in the, the Marvel, how to draw comics the Marvel way. Silver Surfer and Spider-Man, right? You've got two, you got an antagonist and a protagonist. And I would stick to that. I would get yourself, a, you know, an antagonist, which is your bad guy, and your protagonist, your good guy. And, uh, and let them have a, a situation that's engaging and fun you know, and is action-packed, maybe, or is just, you know, kind of pops out at you there for three pages, and, you know, and tell a little little gag. Um, you know, I, I think that's the way to hook people, and they, they'll like that, you know, and you could, it could be a gag strip, you could have a joke, you know, there's could be a punchline, there could be, you know, the setup, you know, the hit them with the gag, got the punchline, that's always entertaining, that's, and that's the the uh, the thing and it even says it in both books be entertaining you want to entertain people um, that's the whole reason they're they're reading it um, is to entertain them and you, you know you have to find things that are entertaining what entertains you uh, and what entertains a lot of people so if you uh, especially if you're doing fan art uh, if you're doing fan art you got to realize who's Let's say you're doing uh, Marvel, right, for example. You're going to sol solely do Marvel fan art. Okay. you got to think, uh, well, who's your audience? Is it the general Marvel audience? Is it an X-Men audience? Is it a Spider-Man audience? Is it a, you know, what's the, what's the number one comic? What's the most popular Marvel comics? You know, I still think it's X-Men. However, you know, because the MCU and, you know, the whole thing with that, They've really pushed the Avengers for the last, you know, whatever, 15 years or so. So, you know, I, I always make this comment, and I made this comment even with when the Avengers movie came out and they were building up to it, and I didn't know at the time that Sony owned the rights to X-Men. I wasn't really paying attention to that. And I thought to myself, why are they going so heavy on the Avengers? I said, back when I was collecting comics, you know, in the 80s and into the 90s, I said, nobody cared about the Avengers, really. It was all X-Men, X-Men and Spider-Man. And, you know, obviously, you know, the X-Men cartoon came out in the 90s. That was a huge hit. Spider-Man cartoon was a huge hit. Um, the Spider-Man movie, the X-Men movies, huge hits, right? I didn't realize, oh, those were both, you know, were purchased. The rights were purchased during the whole bankruptcy to save Marvel by Sony. So they couldn't do that. I didn't. I didn't realize that until lunch later, and I was like, "Oh, okay." So they have to basically go with Marvel Studios to go with what they've got, and they've got the Avengers. So they really pushed the Avengers. But like I said, back when Spider-Man and you know McFarlane's on Spider-Man, you know you've got uh, Jim Lee on X-Men or whatever. I mean, you couldn't. Those two comic books. They're like Batman. I mean, they could basically, you could just do endless X-Men and Spider-Man comics, and there's no real reason to do anything else. Let's just talk Marvel. So, you know, uh, nobody really cared about the Avengers. Avengers was such an afterthought comic book at that time. Uh, so, because this, because Marvel, you know, had to go with the Avengers, because they didn't have the movie rights for those comics, they kind of downplayed the... Um, they downplayed the X-Men 
comics and then really lifted up the movie with that. So the this MCU, I think, did a lot of... I think it did a couple of things. It, it didn't really damage... People, some people say, oh, it, well, if it wasn't for the MCU, the comic books would have gone away a long time ago. Maybe. Um, and then some people say, oh, you know, including myself, I said, oh, you know, the MCU's destroyed comic books. Maybe. I think that it's definitely changed everything. Uh, so take that into, into, my, into, your, into mind. So if you're going to do, let's say you're going to do fan art comics of Marvel characters. Um, pick who's popular. You're always going to be safe with Spider-Man. I mean, Spider-Man, like I said, Spider-Man, the X-Men, and then with the Avengers, you've got, uh, you know, Iron Man got real popular. Black Widow's huge. Uh, you know, the Hulk's always, uh, always a fun one to do. Go with the main hitters. You know, go with the, the, the A-tier characters, I would, for the most part. And, and push those heavily. Like I said, and hit people with three-page stories about those characters. Here's the thing. When it comes to fan art, there's a lot of gray area on what you can and can't do. And, you know, you obviously you don't own the rights to these characters. And now you're going to start making money using licensed characters. I'm not going to get into the whole all of it on, uh, on fair use laws. Uh, but... The, the easiest way I've found to get around that is parody. And it's, you you can parody anything. So, and, I, you know, my all my stories are funny. Because humor is entertaining. So, I, you know, and the more absurd, the better. And here you gotta, you gotta, you gotta also look at comic books and go, okay, these characters, right from the get-go, are absurd. They always have been. To think that they're anything else but absurd is you're you're delusional. You know this isn't high art. This isn't Shakespeare. This isn't uh, you know great literature. These are goofy characters in extreme situations and uh, and with outrageous stories. Right, that off the bat, comic characters, the superhero genre, all into itself is a parody of itself. It's funny. You know what I mean? It's entertaining because it's so out there. It's so you know, over the top. Now, if you make fun of that, like, say, like, the Venture Brothers did it, um, a lot of different, you know, things have parodied the absurdity in the of comic book characters and superheroes, you know, that's entertaining. People like, I like that, and my people like it, you know. So, that's the, you can circumvent, uh, you know, the copyright infringement by fair use by going parody. And really stress the parody. I mean, this is you're making fun of these characters. I mean, there's other little things you can do, like you can not call them by their names. You can change their names. They could be derivatives. There's, like I said, go look, look up fair use law. I'll make a video at some point on fair use laws and doing fan art. But um, you know, for, for the most part, I think it's it's always it's it's Marvel and DC specifically. I think they they. It's not, it's not really frowned upon, but it's not encouraged. It's just kind of just, we just, it just exists, right? They're not going to go after everybody who's making parodies, you know, or making fan art. So it's a nice place to be. You've already got pre, you've already got a pre-generated uh, audience because there's people already like that stuff. And if they like your art and you lay like your, your you know, the way you parody the characters and your storytelling, you've already, you've got, you've got a, you know, you just got to get your stuff out there and you just got to build up your following. So that's that's what I did. Um, you know, it took me a while, um, but I got there. I, you know, I'd like to get bigger, but I mean, I got to a point where I'm comfortable, sort of comfortable. I'm not super comfortable, but I mean, I'm close to being comfortable. And, uh, and I've got a pretty good following. So, and again, none of my stories are that great. I'm not, I'm really not a writer, you know, I'm not... I, I, I'm basically, I look at things that happen in comics and, you know, I read the stories, read about the characters, and I, and I kind of, and I'm, I poke fun of it. You know, I, I make fun of it and tell jokes about it. You know, I would think before a writer, I'm definitely more of a comedian than a writer because I can't write seriously and I'm not, I don't have the writing chops to really pull off something, you know, magnificent. 
and again, that's subjective. Um, I think the my stuff, the, the uh, I think the coolest compliment somebody gave me not that long ago was, I love your stuff. It's, uh, what is it? It's stoop. Well, I should remember what it was. Uh, it's a beautiful, wonderfully stupid. <laughs> I think that's the best compliment. And I agree 100%. It, it's wonderfully stupid. Um, it's absurd. It's tongue in cheek. It's, uh, it's like totally outrageous. I mean, I totally, you know, exploit as much of the, uh, you know, without getting too much in detail, what it is, I exploit the absurdity of what I'm doing to the nth degree. And I do it with like a 12 year old mentality, you know, kind of a 12 year old sense of humor. Um, and, uh, you know, it with a little, maybe a little bit of sophistication in there, but not, not, not much. And, uh, and so it's funny and it becomes, it's like family guy stupid, you know, it's like, uh, it's, you know, South, you know, South Park's a little bit more, uh, I think it's a little more uh, sophisticated, but my stuff, I would say it's probably like a, a family guy stupid uh, mixed with, uh, you know, some great art. You know, I, I mean, I'm not, not trying to toot my own horn, but I've been worked at, it, worked at it for a long time, and I enjoy the stuff that I do, and other people do as well. So, again, uh, sorry, I want to make a, a long story short here with script writing. Know your audience. Uh, don't take yourself too seriously. Um, go for short strips or short comics um, so you can generate a lot of them, get them out there, uh, and hook people in, you know, and it, like I said, and don't commit your, to yourself to anything very large. Uh, this is just my experience. I mean, you can do with whatever you want. You can, if you want to write a 150-page graphic novel, just go, go right ahead. I, I'm not, I can't really tell you how to do that because I don't do that kind of thing. I'm just telling you on specifically what I do. And I have done a couple of 20 pages. You know, I think the first three issues of my last comic were 20 page stories. And again, I think I shot myself on the foot because I kind of, I was, I got too invested in them. So I kind of, my newer ones, I'm kind of, you know, trying to right the ship by bringing down the page count and just, you know, moving through characters faster. So eventually I come to a character quickly that somebody will like. You know, here's the thing. If you, let's say you do Spider-Man, right? Um, and somebody says, oh, I like this Spider-Man. And they, they subscribe to your, um, whatever your platform is. You know, your Patreon, whatever. They subscribe to it because they love your comics. And then three pages later, you're doing The Incredible Hulk, right? They might think, oh, well, I don't really like the Hulk so much. Uh, I, I, when, when's he going to do Spider-Man? So that person leaves, right? Well, hopefully within like a couple of weeks, you've already got, you know, you've gotten back to maybe Spider-Man. Or maybe a month later, you come back to Spider-Man. You know, and it's like, then you might bring that Spider-Man fan back. You know, you might lose the Hulk fan now. But then, you know, it's kind of like, you see what I'm saying? Is it's if, The quicker you, you throw out the stuff, you can, you can cater to a larger group of people. And, you know, Go for DC. I mean, do do Marvel. You know, let's say you do She-Hulk. You know, She-Hulk's one of the ones that I've known for. Do She-Hulk. All the She-Hulk people come for that, and then you know, but all the Wonder Woman people because they like Wonder Woman. They're like, hey, well, I like to see him do Wonder Woman. Um, you know, then I switch gears and I do go to DC and I do a Wonder Woman uh, story, right? Now I've got the Wonder Woman people, right? The She-Hulk people might leave. But I might come back to She-Hulk in another month or two, and those people might come back. So, like I said, the quicker you, oh, snap my finger, the quicker you uh, um, can filter through as many people as as many characters as possible, the more you can, uh, you know, keep people coming back more frequently. Because you know, when they come back, they spend money, and obviously, it all adds up. So that's what I've been doing. Um, you know, I. I primarily do I mean if, if you see my stuff you know like again if you want to know any you want me to give you any uh, links and stuff just let me know and I'll I'm not gonna you know broadcast it on what I'm doing here because my stuff is a it's a very particular storyline um, and it's not for the youngsters let's put it that way so um, you might want to uh, you know if you want to check out my stuff you know you know 
hit me up and I'll, I'll give you the links to the stuff. But um, I'm going to try to keep my examples pretty, uh, you know, all ages here. Um, because, I mean, like I said, the, what I'm drawing from is an all, it's Marvel Comics, DC Comics. I mean, it's all ages stuff. It's the stuff that I love. I mean, if I do He-Man or do G.I. Joe, you know, I'm drawing from the things that I liked as a kid, you know, the things I really like, you know, I'm just taking it into a more adult uh, world. So, um, you know, so, and there's, there, there definitely is a fan base for that, you know, it, it, it exists in not just in comics, it's, you know, anime, everything, you know, call it what you, you call it fan service, call it hentai, call it whatever you want to call it, call it adult comics. It's, uh, it, there's definitely a market for it, because, uh, I mean, sex sells, let's just, let's be honest, it's sex sells, and you've also, if you want to think about making money and building a career, I would start with things that are foolproof, uh, and things that stand the test, stand the test of time, are foolproof, cater to, I'm not saying the lowest common denominator, that's really not really the, the, a good, you know, uh, descriptor of who you're looking for but just you're you're catering to people's base uh what do you call it base um interests and you're covering a wide variety of characters that appeal to a large group of audience i mean and uh you know and it's 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 a good place to start now here's the you can get pigeonholed and you probably will get pigeonholed if that's all you do because everybody's going to expect that so if you have some plans in the future to create some, you know, epic and all ages epic, you know, or whatever, something that maybe moves out of the not safe for work realm. Um, you're, uh, you might be pigeonholed, you know, people might not be on board with that, you know, so maybe you might not want to do that. There's, I know people who refuse to do the not safe for work stuff for that simple reason is they don't want to be pigeonholed for, you know, and locked into that, you know, what they're doing. I've always liked it <laughs> since I've been a teenager, you know, so I've, I, I, and I've always aspired to do those types of stories. So I'm right, I'm right in my wheelhouse. I'm, I don't, I'm, I don't really aspire to make some giant epic. I, I, I've always fancied myself wanting to do that, but realistically it's come down to my base interests, you know, um, and and the types of characters I like, and I happen to like Marvel characters. I happen to like DC characters. I happen to like, you know, obviously you, I've you've been watching my videos. You know the type of stuff I like. Um, I like all of that. So, uh, you know, I, I'm basically doing exactly what I want to do. Uh, so I don't mind being, you know, stuck in that that lane. I'll stay in that lane. Again, if, if that's something that you want to do. Uh, you know, I, I got I, I got lots of stuff to tell you how to do that. Again, we're we're going back to scripts. Sorry, I'm 33 minutes in and I really haven't got through the script. Here's the thing: scripts aren't really that hard. You can do uh, the Marvel way, the Marvel method, or you can do a, a finished script. Right? I prefer a finished script. I'll use the Marvel method. I personally, for my stuff, I kind of go back and forth. I'll use the Marvel method to come up with a plot. But then when it comes down to hashing it out, maybe, and if I have time, like I had plenty of time this last week, I could write a better script, you know, by, by writing it out, right? But sometimes I don't have the time to do that. And all I, and I literally, it's like, I don't even have a story idea in my head. I've got to put a page out today and I haven't even started and I don't know what I'm doing, right? I've been in that situation many times. And here's what I do is I'll start out with, I'll grab a couple of characters I like. Hey, I haven't done these characters in a while, or I want to do these characters. Boom, I got my characters. You know, I might, oh, there's a there's a story involved those characters that I remember reading that just recently. Boom, I'm going to loosely base it off that situation. I'm going to hit myself with a, a quick plot of what's going on. Most of my stuff is kind of derivative anyways. It's not super formulaic, but it is kind of formulaic. So I pretty much know I'm going to hit my certain, you know, tropes and beats. It, you know, and go with it. So, I've already, everything's already kind of mapped out for me. So now, 
Do I need to sit there and write a script? No, I could probably just start laying out the page. You know, I could probably start laying out my uh, panels and I can just start writing dialogue and captions right there on the page as I go. And boom, Bob's your uncle. You know, I got a page ready to go. You know, I've, I've done the line art, taken a few hours to do the line art. Hey, maybe I'm going to post it tomorrow or, uh, you know, it, or maybe the end of the day today. So I'm going to, you know, bust out the color, color it up, you know, finish it up. Eight hours, boom, I got a page to post post it. I don't like to be in that situation, but I have been in that situation a lot because just life gets in the way. You know, if you're doing this full time, but you're also trying to, you know, manage, I've got a son, you know, I've got other responses. There's other, like I said, I had some family issues that have been going on here since Christmas. So there's other things going on. And, uh, and I've also, I'm doing commissions for other people as well. So things get in the way. You know, I try to stay on a, a schedule for my main comic. Like I said, I try to post at least once a week, if not twice a week. And I usually alternate. I usually post like Monday and Friday. The next week I'll post just Friday. It gives me some time to have a weekend and be able to get some commissions done and, you know, uh, spend some time with my son. And then, boom, the next week I'm going to post a couple of Monday and a Wednesday. And then I'll post commissions on Wednesdays, you know, to kind of keep that interest going. Because a lot of people like to see my commissions because it, by showing people your commissions, it creates more interest for more commissions, you know. Like I said, it's, it's, a, it's a treadmill. And you just got to gotta keep the treadmill going. Because you got to keep the money coming and to pay the bills. So... Again, let's get back to the script. So, plot. So, the easiest way to des describe the Marvel method is if you go, you know, this book here, if you go to the page, what, I don't know what the page number is. I think it's uh, 112. Let's see. There's a page number in the book. Um, let's see, it's called Here's a Plot. It's kind of towards the back of the book. Uh, it's kind of, there's an example with the Silver Surfer and uh, Spider-Man, like I was saying, and they kind of, page 130. So, in 130, which is right in front of you here, you've got uh, the simple description here, which I think is very, very simple. Here's that six, six panel. This is like essentially verbatim a six panel page. And again, remember, like I said, if you just want to do this top panel as a full wide panel, you just want to do, you know, this is a wide panel, wide panel, you want to do a uh, panel one, you know, panel two, and then maybe uh, panel three, panel four, then hit it with the wide one on the bottom. Maybe you want to do the whole four as one giant kind of splash, and then a horizontal in the bottom, or vice versa. You got, or the whole thing is just one splash page, whatever you want to do. If you're doing a three page story, I would probably avoid a splash page because it takes up a lot of real estate and you want the panels. You want at least 15 panels to tell that gag. So I would probably do five panel pages. You know, but here's, here's, this is like a real goofy way of looking at it. This is how I look at it. I figure first panel is a wide panel. I'm setting up two characters. Action, 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 action. Second page, the middle page, the, the conflict or like the, the main meat of it, right? I'll go panel, panel, you know, square, square, rectangle in the middle, square, square, right? And then when I go to the third page, I'll do square, 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 and then a rectangle. So my my wide panel starts at the top on the first page, moves to the middle in the second page, the middle page, because it's in the middle, and then moves to the last panel, which basically ends the story with a, with a wide shot at the bottom of the last page. That's a real simple way to do it. I've been using it that way a lot lately just because it's quick and easy and it really it hits it down and I've got five panels a page 15 panels three pages that's how I've been doing it but anyways let's go back to the plot here so the plot this is the easiest way to describe how to write a plot right here um, so spider-man uh, is out for revenge against the silver surfer finds him on a rooftop that's this panel here right silver surfer warns our friendly neighborhood webhead to stay back, boom, got this one, 
In order to show Spidey, Spidey that he means business, oh, yeah, ba 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 ba. Uh, old S Silver Surfer uh, mildly zings him a teensy cosmic bolt. Boom! Shoots shoots Spider Man. Spider Man, or Spidey, having been knocked off his feet, decides to f fight back. He's getting back up. Uh, Spider Man quickly zips some webbing at Silver Surfer. Zing! Shoots him around the legs. Yeah, catching him around the ankles. And then finally, the Silver Surfer wraps, wrapped in Spidey's webbing, loses his balance and topples off the rooftop. So there goes Silver Surfer. Okay, so if you notice, as this next sentence points out, this scenario is written so that each sentence, each descripting sentence, is a panel. So you've got six sentences in this paragraph. You've got six panels. Each sentence is a panel. That's, as quick, that's the easiest, quick and dirty way to think of how to just write the Marvel method. Because um, you're not even coming up with dialogue. You can do the dialogue later, you know, come up with your witty banter, you know, captions, whatever you want. But if you just want to describe to somebody six panels, give them six sentences uh, to describe it. In one paragraph, that's your page. Um, here's the other thing I want to point out, you want to bear in mind. And I try to tell other people who are writing scripts for me this all the time is, Limit your ands. Don't even if it's a three-page panel. Don't even put an and. Meaning, don't say Spider-Man's out for revenge against the Silver Surfer. Like finds him on a rooftop, right? That's simple. You could say and finds him on the rooftop. You basically are saying what he's doing, but don't say Spider-Man's you know out for revenge against the Silver Surfer, and he's juggling. And he's uh, Silver Surfer is coughing. And you don't keep putting these ands in one panel because you can't do that. It's physically impossible to draw these two characters doing more than one thing. So basically, Spider Man's out for revenge, right? He's there. Boom. Uh, I think this is, I can't remember which one, Spider Man. Um, we'll go back. I still can't tell. So, okay, Spider-Man's the, the one in the foreground. Okay. So, you know, he's basically, he's coming up against Silver Surfer. Silver Surfer's there, right? That's it. Don't say anything more. No more ands. He doesn't need to be doing 15,000 things in one panel because you can't do it. You can't physically write that. So, again, make it super simple. I mean, the keep, you know, kiss, keep it super simple, stupid, that type of thing. You've you're you're telling a a scenario, a three page scenario. In this case, they only give you one page. But the thing is, let's just say he's gonna after Silver Surfer topples off the roof, you know he regain he breaks out of the webbing and he comes back after Spider Man, right? Or maybe another character swoops in, and joins the fray, whatever. But you know, don't get carried away with that either. So, uh, you know, the easiest way to uh, to do this is is this just the Marvel method? You know, if you were if you weren't really a writer and you didn't want to take time writing a lot of script and you're writing a, something up for me to do a story, I would do that. Say, hey, you know, you know that I work on the six panel system. Maybe you don't want to have six panels in each page. Which I, also I agree. Do not do three pages straight of six panels in equal squares. It's. <sighs> It's, it, it's doable, and obviously you'll see a lot of that in older Marvel's, classic Marvel comics. But at the same time, it gets, it gets real stale real quick. Vary things up. Wide angles are awesome. You know, think about them cinematically. It's widescreen. You don't, you know, I, sure you could watch television on the old square TVs and every single page is a square, but, you know, go for a wide panel, you know. I know, uh, I know all the old people, you know, had to, lost their shit when they started making widescreen TV, or when they started letterboxing everything. I paid million dollars for my 900 inch television set and I want to get every every, uh, I don't know why they got southern all of a sudden, but every single you know, pennies worth of every little pixel on that screen. Why do you make it? Why do I have black bars on the top and bottom? It's stupid. Dumbasses think like that. Old dumbasses think like that. Uh, you know what I mean? It, it, they, as I said, I don't want to get super, you know, hoity-toity, you know, up my own ass about about uh, film, film. But I mean, they're shot in widescreen, right? 
you dumbass. They had the pan scan make it for television, right? That's. I mean, I guess that argument's kind of moot because most people, you know, most of those people are dead <laughs> or very old, and uh, most of the younger people, you know, know uh, like you know, know what how movies are shot, right? You don't have to be a film buff to realize you know, it's widescreen. Everything's widescreen now. Your your smart TVs and your 4K television sets, they're all widescreen. You, pretty much you watch everything in 16-9 ratio anyways. So it's kind of, you know, moot. So again, but f considering that, don't make every single panel a square panel. Everything's not a 4 by you know, a 4-6 ratio here. Or actually be a 4-4 four, four or 6-6 six, six because it would be a direct square. But like I said, you can vary that up a little bit. If you are going to do the six panel squares, don't make everyone a square. Maybe make one a slightly bigger rectangle. Maybe like a six, a six nine, and then uh, I don't know what the opposite of a six nine would be to, to fill in the gap. But obviously, you're going to have a more narrow panel in the next one. You know, vary it up so that see that line that goes through the middle, that gutter line, those kind of stagger a little bit. You know, they're a little offset. Um, and a lot of a lot of classic guys did that too because they got sick of doing the four panel or the six panel like that. So they staggered things even when they were doing a six panel page. Um, I mean, you can you can do anything with the panel. You can break them out, move them, you know, get all creative all you want. Diagonal panel, blah blah blah. I try to stay pretty s old school because I pretty much draw old school. So I kind of work on that. Um, but yeah, that's it. So a plot. Um, now, when it comes to dialogue, let's say you're writing those two characters, the, the rule of thumb is uh, in each panel, don't have one character say more than 20 words. And if you have two people in a panel, right, that's 40 words. Try not to go over 40 words, 20, 20 words a person. Now, you obviously can break that rule you know, or have nobody speaking in a panel, but the rule of thumb is 20 words a person, um, and that might be two speech balloons, right? You might say like, holy shit! You know, one speech balloon, and then I can't believe Silver Surfer have all off the roof. Boom, right? And then some other person says, I know, right? <laughs> you know, so 20, 20 words a person go to the next person. Here's the other thing, and I, I'm totally guilty of this, and I try to avoid this because it takes so much time. If you do have a big cast, avoid getting a big cast, and if you do have a big cast, don't put, if you have six characters in your comic, and you have six panels on a page, don't put all six characters in all six panels. You will be there forever drawing that. And it's so cluttered and so dense, and it looks like shit. You know, and I, I'm not I'm not trying to tell you anything that I haven't done. I've done it quite a bit, and I try to avoid it as much as possible. Um, I think the two two character uh, you know, dance basically between two characters, um, and six, you know, six up to six panels a page on three pages. Each person, you know, says no more than 20 words in each panel. And, and I, you don't always have to have a back and forth, but I like the ping pong. I like when like one person says something and there's always like a counter. Somebody counters what they say with something. Next page panel, somebody says something, somebody counters, somebody answers the question or, or, you know, adds on to it or gives their two cents. I like that. So, and I don't do that in every panel, but I like that where the, because two characters usually, even if they're fighting, right, I like to have a conversation because, like I said, my stuff's funny. And if they're cracking jokes, you know, or saying really stupid things, it's it's comedic and it becomes, uh, you know, becomes entertaining because you're not just seeing two people duke it out or do other things like in my comic. Um, they're they're having a, a, a goofy conversation, a ping pong back and forth conversation. You know, watch Venture Brothers, watch uh, Archer, watch Family Guy, watch South Park, watch The Simpsons. You know, watch all of that type of comedy, and you'll see there's always this back and forth, this ping pong, uh, you know, basically the ping pong match of just witty dialogue back and forth. And that's what I try to put in my stuff. Um, trying to be mindful of time. This will probably be a little bit longer video, so. Uh, it's kind of, people might have been waiting for this video too, so I'm going to make it a little bit longer than an hour. Not too much longer. Um, but yeah, so you've got uh, the plot there. Uh, yeah, and the other way to do it, obviously, is to write a script. I think the easiest way, there's a couple of different scripts. The one I pulled up an example real quick is uh, the scripting thing from the uh, Marvel tryouts. There's a plot. 
right, with, uh, you know, like page 15, they basically break each panel, each page down, and they give their little panel descriptions, and each one of these uh, sentences is a panel, right? That's the plot. Now if we go to the script, uh, where's the script? I thought they had a script. Oh, here we go, the script. Okay, so the way they do this is uh, they got a page here, uh, the page number. Um, I believe this is the. What are the numbers? You know, I actually I don't know how they did this. So they got the dialogue here. That's also not a great way to do a script either. I I found here. I'm gonna pull up a note notepad here. I'm gonna show you. This is this is how. Let's do it small so you can see because otherwise it'd be crazy looking. So here's what I would do. This is like, this is what a page should look like. Here's my example. This is exactly how I do them. I'm gonna say uh, page one, right? Let's let's do the let's do a comic title on top, right? Okay, maybe there's a subtitle, you know, whatever. Something how you, you you'll know that it, what you got here, and then do uh, page one. Now. Page panel one's actually got a lot more into it than normally, so let's just kind of skip ahead. Let's say we're in the middle of the book. Let's say we're on page page two, and we're on panel six. Uh, no, panel well, panel one of page two, which would be if you're doing five panel, it'd be the sixth panel. Okay, so here's panel one. Uh, underline it or whatever, bold face it. You can't really do that in Notepad, but um, you know, make it so it's easier to. To, to look at. Now, here's what I would do. I would just go, you do your um, panel description, just like in the, just like in the plots, you know, panel description, write that here, underneath panel one, you know, Spider-Man and Silver Surfer square off on a rooftop in Manhattan, you know, there you go. Um, okay, and then you want to do, the first thing you want to do is, is there a caption? I, sometimes that I'll, I'll do that. Just you know, you got a caption here. Uh, let's say the caption's your narration, right? Hey, true believers, you know that type type of thing. Whatever narration, you know, some type of or maybe some exposition. Maybe it's just um, maybe it's just it just says you know Manhattan, uh, you know, early afternoon. Noon on top the Baxter building. And then dot dot dot, because obviously dot the, the story, the page itself is gonna be your um actually that would go on page one, but anyways, um that would be your uh, lead into it. Okay, and then I always italicize your um your captions and then also uh, write justify them. So when they fit in and use a box, don't use a bubble Use a, a square box, a narration box. That way it nice, keeps them nice and concise. And if you're going to put that in that first panel, uh, put it in the left-hand top column. Right? I mean, you can do more than one caption, but start out by putting that, because you want to establish they're on top of the Baxter building, blah, 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 blah. You know, it's early afternoon in Manhattan. Um, and then, you know, let's say uh, Silver Surfer. You know, denote who's talking. If they're going to use a speech balloon, uh, you know, uh, not a word balloon, all speech balloons are just assumed that they're all speech balloons, but if they use a thought balloon, don't put thought balloon, just put thinks in parentheses. That way you know that Silver Surfer is thinking this. In the book, it, it talks about uh, thought balloons are the crutch for bad, crutch for bad writing. I don't necessarily agree with that, but what I do agree with is keep your thought balloons to a minimum and keep them to the protagonist or whoever the main character is of your story. If it's in this case, it's the protagonist, like Spider-Man. Spider-Man thinks to himself, hey, oh my gosh, why is the Silver Surfer here? That type, type of thing. You know, like, or who's this guy? Who's this Silver guy? Right? Don't have, then don't have the Silver Surfer think, who's this webhead guy? You know, who's this spider looking guy? You don't have back and forth uh, thought balloons. Have back and forth speech, but don't have back and forth thought balloons. And keep uh, your thought balloons down to your main whoever this whoever is the character. So, like the narration could be the the main protagonist is talking about like something an incident that happened, 
you know, maybe it's a flashback, and they're narrating it, you know, and then that character also thinks something in their head when, like, hey, what the heck was that, right? Um, they think. But don't do both characters thinking, and, and all, even if it is the main character, keep it down to a minimum. But let's just assume that every other speech balloon is going to be a speech balloon. You know, Silver Surfer says, uh, says, uh, you know, um, whatever, uh, stand aside, mortal. Or stand aside, yeah, mortal. Whatever. Um, and he's going to, he's going to yell it. Most of the time people are shouting. You know, they're not just like one, hey, stand aside. You know, they're not, they're, they're shouting it. He's shouting it to him. Hey, if he's really shouting it, do the thing. I did this. If you shout three times in a in a uh, in a panel or on a page, that means he shouts. The second time he shouts louder, do second. If he shouts third louder, put three on him. That's how I think about it. Um, but he's going to shout, right? And then follow it up. And so you got three simple words. I mean, like I said, no more than twenty words in that dialogue. And then Spider Man. Uh, he comes back with, uh, uh, hey friend, or hey buddy, hey buddy, hey guy, <laughs> hey buddy, uh, 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 who, who put you in, who, who put you, or who, who made, who made you, uh, who made you God, right, okay question mark and you can do a he could yell it let's just say question mark right who made you god right obviously you know silver surfer could probably come back to him and say i'm not a god i'm a herald of galacta you know something I, i'm being really <laughs> this is not good storytelling but anyways uh, but you get the point right do that that's your panel one if there's a sound effects you know like maybe he's hit some of the bolt or whatever then put your just put sfx or just fx and put a you know Zappo. And do it in all caps, because you're probably going to do all caps when you when you letter that in. Um, here's the other thing. Don't, if you're writing a script, right, for somebody else, do not do this. Do not put quotations. And the reason why is, when I get a script, I'm going to assume it's typed correctly. Obviously, spell checkers should pull out any, you know, spelling errors. But the thing is, I'm going to do this. I'm going to copy exactly what you put. I'm going to hit Control C, right? And when I go to the when I go to uh, Clip Paint, I'm going to boom. I'm going to just paste it right in there, and then I'm going to say, okay, well that, now I'm gonna, now I got to break it apart, you know, and kind of, and then boom, I'm going to throw a balloon on it. I throw a, a regular. Uh, speech balloon on it and it'll, it'll form fit it to that so i'm going to copy and paste the script so if i have to sit there and go oh geez i gotta go in but i gotta go in between these stupid quotations right just don't put them there i know who's i know what i know that somebody's speaking i know it's a quote because you've got the person who's saying it right there i know what it is just put the and that's why i say just do simple like this so i can just go ahead and i could just grab a hold of this really quick in a script and boom copy paste so that's it that's that's a panel that's panel that's a panel in it it doesn't have to be any fancier it can be longer than that the scene description can be a little longer like i said try to keep it down to you know pretty simple and again maybe silver surfer says 20 words and spider-man comes back 20 words they feeling really wordy that day um you know and then you don't have a special effect, or you do have a special effect. Maybe there's two special effects. There's probably, try to also keep one special effect, or one sound effect, special, one sound effect per um, page. Don't have, like, you know, the computer's buzzing, bzzz, you know, and have somebody zappo, and then have, you know, thunder at the same time. I mean, that's too complicated. Keep the, you want the eyes to go right to that sound effect, and they want to be that the main action. So if Silver Surfer zaps Spider-Man, and you get the zappo, right, you want us you want that's the main action of that panel so go with that um, and again just rinse and repeat panel three rinse and repeat until you're done with the page that's it that's all the script is right um, if that's if you want to do the dialogue specifically right if you just want to if you just want to hit me with a with a, a plot 
you know, five sentences for each panel, one for each panel, and then I'll give it to you, and then you want to come back with me, or you want to come back later with the, with the dialogue, that's fine, but I find when, when you're presenting a script for me to do for a commission, it's best just to do a full script like this. That way I know how many words are going to be in the panel, because I, you know, and also keep things varied out. Here's the other thing you might want to do, or I do as an artist, is if there's a dead spot in the art, like I've already committed to a panel and I drew a panel and I kind of know where the, I know where the word balloons are going to get, but I got this dead spot, right? And I say like, okay, well, what do I don't have in this panel? I don't have a sound effect. Okay, I can fill a sound effect in that dead spot. Or maybe I can hit another, I can fill it with something. Maybe the guy only says like five words. Well, maybe I can have him say like a follow-up or something. I can fill those dead spots in with, with dialogue. But for the most part, if you give me a script like this, I can compensate for what they're going to say in the panel for the artwork. Um, so, okay, we hit an hour. So that's it. I mean, that's really it, the storytelling. I mean, I'm kind of telling you the do's and don'ts a little bit here and there. Um, but now the whole thing is just to come up with something to do. So, like I said, if it's a comic book, that's a fan art comic book, and it's about Marvel comic book characters, like I said, that's what I do or DC, but I'm just keeping it as basic as possible. I have an antagonist, I have a, you know, a protagonist, you know, I have an establishing shot, I have an establishing page, I've got a, you know, the conflict page or whatever, and then I've got a, a resolve, right? The third page is a resolve, and I resolve it by that third panel, you know. Silver Surfer, I've established that Silver Surfer and Spider-Man are fighting on a rooftop in Manhattan, right? My middle page, they're really they're getting into the conflict. Maybe they're just talking on the first page, and now they've they've resorted to fisticuffs or their superpowers for the, you know, for the third page. That's the main meat of it. And then they've then they you know they've tuckered each other out, or maybe one of them's knocked the other one out, and he's taking, you know, maybe Spider Man, or maybe Silver Surfer blasted Spider Man with a blast that knocked Spider Man out. He throws Spider-Man over his shoulder, and he flies away in a surfboard. That would be the resolve. And he's like, he's like, hmm, I'm taking this mortal with me. He might know something, or you know, he might be worth whatever, you know. And he flies away, and you resolve. That's the that is the gag. That and that is the short. There's no subplots there, outside of maybe how did they get there? Why is Silver Surfer fighting Spider-Man? And these are questions you can ask yourself, but they're really not specific subplots. You just take just. Give it the benefit of the doubt that, you know, these two characters have shown up to do something, you know, to fight. Or they've shown up, you know, for some reason. Obviously, the simplest one is somebody's breaking into a house, you know, and a villain's breaking into a house. And then the, the, the hero shows up to thwart the villain, you know. Um, you know, it's like, why is he robbing the house? I don't care. He's just, he's robbing the house, right? Why is Spider-Man there to stop this crook? How did he see? It doesn't matter, right? Just just make up a little scene like that and do it out. Like I said, you can do a long story. You can do this huge script. You can do this giant epic, this giant, you know, you can do the... Here's the thing is, I don't know how many times... And I've known people to do this, and I'm guilty of it myself. Is they always want to write the next Watchmen, or they want to ne write the next Walking Dead, or they want to write the next Dark Knight Returns. Um, it's okay to to have those aspirations, but you know what? When it comes down to just making some cash and doing something you love, drawing some superheroes, you know, in a comic, putting a short comics out, I really wouldn't. I really wouldn't, you know, dream of that because that's again, that's a long, involved process. It's going to take you a long time to write if you even got the chops to write it the first place. And you're talking about a major project, and sure, if it's like a side pet project and you've got a full-time job or you've got a way, you know, to do that, that's fine. Then you know, maybe you're gonna for the next ten years, you're gonna secretly write the next Watchmen, you know, in your free time, and then one of these days it might actually get get made or you can be like me where it's like I gotta eat and I've gotta stay warm you know I gotta take care of my son so I'm going to I'm gonna constantly be cranking out pages after pages after pages and short stories quick 
because I need to get as hook as many people in as I can who like specific characters, and then you know, and I need to come be able to come back to those characters. And I guess if you think about it, the whole, I have a lot of similar themes in all of my stories, so I guess the whole thing is just one giant story, right? And there's just many chapters in it. But I usually don't think about it like that. I think about it in just these short, small scenes. Um, you know, uh, you know. If you're writing adult stuff, think about it like a two-minute clip on Pornhub, right? That's what you're writing. You're writing a two-minute clip on Pornhub or a ten-minute clip on Pornhub, right? That's what you're writing. Uh, so. Think about if you want to take the adult aspect out of it. Think of a you you a, a fight scene clip. You know, a two minute or five minute long fight scene clip on YouTube of two characters fighting, a wrestling match. Let's say a good example, a wrestling match. Think about a wrestling match. You know, the the wrestling. You establish the wrestlers are in the ring. One guy's talking smack to the other guy. The other guy's talking smack to the other guy. They lock up. You know, there's a body slam or two, there's a headlock, there's a camel clutch, there's a pile driver. That's like, you know, the, the second page or the end of the first page into the second page. You know, oh, he's, you know, maybe there's a little bit of a, oh, you know, he always gonna, he's gonna pin him. Oh, he kicks out of it. And then somebody runs in, hits the guy over the head with a, with a chair and knocks him out. And the ref didn't see it. And the guy pins him in the, in the last panel, you resolve the matches won, or maybe he pins him in the second to last panel. And the last panel is, you know, the guy, you know, waking up like, oh, who hit me in the head? Or as the other guys are running away, you know, think about it like that. If you don't want to think about it in an adult context, think about it in a simple fight complex. It's a wrestling match. It's, it's a, it's a ten-minute wrestling match. You know, uh, think about it like that. You know, there's not a lot of story in it. There's some smack talking. There's some comedic moments. There's some hype. There's some things to kind of entertain you there, but you're really not, it's not this long narrative. And I would, that's a good example. Think of comic books, because I mean, they even made alliterations to this with like the thing, you know, and the grapplers and stuff with the whole professional wrestling, you know, thing going on, you know, Madison Square Garden. Think about uh, superheroes fighting. It's a wrestling match, right? Think about what goes into wrestling. Now, sure, there might be this long drawn out, story of you know how you know ricky steamboat i'm dating myself ricky steamboat and uh who was his big adversary um was it uh ha valentine hammer valentine and steamboat were those the big lockup or was it jake the snake whatever there's a tito santana and because there was a figure four leg lock i can't remember who, how, anyways there's some been some long rivalries, right? That kind of went out a bunch of different matches, right? You could do that type of thing, um, but for the most part, wrestling. I mean, even just the bumps, even just the promo bumps, you know, where they get in there and Hulk Hogan's all coked up, you know, and he's like, you know, or, or Macho Man's just talking crazy because he's all coked up, you know, with Mean Gene Okerlund. Think about it like that. That's a little short. What is that? A five minute clip? You know, it's entertaining as all hell. It's funny, you know. It's engaging. It tells a little bit. Oh, there's going to be a match coming up with those two, right? There. That's a three-page story, right? Actually, that would be more like a one-page story. I mean, that would even be the the one, the first couple of panels to establish a shot, and then you go into the match, you know, and then that type of thing. But think about it, quick and short, punchy like that. You can entertain a lot of people with you know that type of storytelling, uh, you know. And if action's your game, and you really love. Sh drawn dudes, you know, beating the piss out of each other. That's a great story. I mean, a lot of, you go to these books, like, well, every story can't just be non-stop action. Yeah, they can. They can actually just be non-stop action. Um, if you do it well, you know, and it really pushes some people buttons and they really want to see that, hell yeah, you know. I, a lot of people, if you could just keep cranking those out, that's the whole point, remember, is keep the treadmill going. Keep cranking this stuff out. Because if every month people are going to keep coming back to your, you know, they've subscribed, you know, just like they subscribe to a comic, you know, to get 12 issues a month, you know, they've subscribed, you know, think about it in like, you know, a Disney Plus subscription or think about it as like a PlayStation Plus account, right? They've subscribed and they're going to pay monthly or maybe they paid for the whole year 
but they're going to pay monthly to see an X amount of number of, uh, of story coming out every month. In my case, I usually do about six pages a month of my own story, sometimes eight if I can really get going. Um, so they're, they're, you know, they're going to see that amount of, of story from me, you know, and, uh, and they're going to pay whatever, you know, my subscription or my, you know, my subscription rate, my, and they're going to pay for that every month and what, you know, and how that plant that plays out. Um, the thing with, you got to also think about when it comes to like, uh, putting stuff on Patreon and stuff. I mean, obviously you're, you're providing, you're, you're, you're a scratching an itch for people who have a specific itch. And if they want to see X character and X character go at it, whether it's fisticuffs or other means, right, they're going to pay a premium to see that because they're not going to get it from Marvel. Maybe they do. Maybe they won't. Um, but my stuff, you're definitely, you're not gonna, Marvel's not going to provide that. Um, so I'm not really in competition with Marvel, for, for saying. Because I'm not, I'm not stepping on their coattails, and they're not going to step on my coattails. Um, and again, and, I, and, I, and I'm, I'm parodying it by making, but because of that fact. And uh, so people are going to pay a premium. They also got to realize you're not Marvel. You're one person, or maybe you're two people, but most of the time, like myself, it's one person. And they know you've got to eat, and they know you've got to put a roof over your head. So they, they're more, they're supporting you. You know, by saying like, "Hey, I'm gonna give this bird. I sure I can buy a comic. I can buy a subscription to She-Hulk for you know 38% off cover price if I get it through Marvel.com, and I'm gonna pay thirty dollars for twelve issues over the course of the next year, right? And they're gonna get actual hard copies, right? But they're, you know, but they know Marvel's not gonna starve if they don't, you know." Do that. I'm sure Marvel's going to go out of business if nobody gets their stuff. But they, Marvel's got enough money and they put up enough product out to keep themselves afloat. Plus, they got Disney to back them. I don't have any of that, so people are more reluctant to give me a little bit more to uh, to get a, a, a less amount of content because a that content is hyper specific. It scratches an itch that Marvel or the next guy is not not doing for them. They happen to like my stuff. And, uh, and they know that, you know, I need to make a living and I'm not, you know, rich. So people will pay a little bit more of a premium for that type of thing. So keep that in mind. Um, you know, I think it's a, it's, it's, a, it's been around for a while. I'm not gonna say it's been out as long as the, uh, as the internet. I mean, I would say Patreon, what started about 10 years ago, eight years ago. Um, and Patreon is not the only one that does it. I mean, you can get subscription services on DeviantArt now. Um, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's basically crowdfunding, you know, it's a crowdfunding monthly subscription model. Um, it's been around for a while and it seems to work. Um, I find it to be pretty, uh, you know, if you want to do comics and you want to put your stuff out there and build a name, build a following and make some money at it, I think it's the way to go, you know, and if you do it a hundred percent digitally and you're not actually printing anything, you have none of that overhead, you know, and again, watch my video on, you know, the tools you need to do it. You don't, I mean, it's a few large purchases, but other than that, they, you don't, you can coast on that for years. Um, and, uh, you know, do I think everybody can do it? No. Um, you know, people say, people have told me, like, why give away your secrets? It's like you're creating competition for yourself. If I, if everybody who watches this video took my advice and did exactly that, right, I don't, still don't think I'm going to be worried about uh, competition. And you know darn well not everybody's going to do that. I'm, maybe one or two people out of a hundred people who see this video are going to actually act upon it and maybe do something like that. Great. You know? Also, the I think the, the more you do, the more it's done, you know, and obviously it's been done it's not done to death, but there's a lot of people doing it. Um, it, it creates more awareness. Every, everything kind of works on itself. Sure, you have competition. Somebody might want to go to theirs over yours, but that's where it's up to you to put out as best stuff as you possibly can get put out and really know your shit and really uh, know your audience and really know what really pushes their buttons and what they want to see. 
and they'll go to you to over to somebody else you know I think it's it all comes down to what you do um, and how you do it and your tastes and in all of it it all comes down to it like so there's no real right or wrong way to do it um, uh, I guess there's wrong ways to do it I guess there's right way but I mean there's it's not there's uh what am I trying to say it's not uh, uh, it's not as cut and dry as that. Like I said, there's guidelines. And this, this whole video, my whole series are more like guidelines. Of, this is how it's done. This is how I do it. And it's been successful for me. And so all I can say is if you, you listen to what I do and do it, you've got a pretty good chance of, of being successful yourself at it. Um, again, you, you hear all these people online. It's like, look, I made a million dollars doing this, and I drive a, a Lamborghini now. And if you do exactly what I do step by step, you'll be driving a Lamborghini too. Maybe. <laughs> um, but you never know until you try, so give it a shot. You know, if you've got time to invest in it, you know, you're really passionate about it, that's the thing it's going to take. It's going to take a lot of passion because you are going to be sitting in this chair for a long time. And you are going to be sitting here at this and this, and you're going to be working at this working station for a long period of time. And you got to have passion and dedication to do that. And you you got to have tough skin. Um, you've got to have uh, perse perseverance and be uh, very tenacious and uh, you know and relentless. I guess is the best cause. Um, I, I, there was a video I didn't watch the video but I saw a video header came about Neil Peart the drummer of Rush and he said you know I I, I wasn't the best drummer this is Neil Peart we're talking about he's like I wasn't the best drummer but I was definitely relentless and that's the thing you might not be the best bass player you might not be the best you know hockey player but if you're relentless about it you'll succeed trust me and uh, I'm not the best out there at this stuff, but I'm pretty relentless and pretty tenacious. And, you know, and, it, it, my high, and because of that, I've got a high output, and that seems to be my secret of success. That's the other secret of success is high output. Crank out as much as you can. If you've got a lot of output and you're constantly bombarding people with content, um, it's going to have an effect. And, uh, you know, if you do one page every six months, it ain't going to work. I would say one page a week is probably the bare minimum that you want to do. I would try to shoot for two pages a week. Um, maybe you can only do one week, one week, right? But I would say the bare minimum right now is two, is one page a week. And uh, I'm just a little bit over that right now. I'm about one to two pages a week. Uh, like I said, six to eight pages a month. So if you... Uh, if you kind of stick to that, I think you'll uh, you'll be you'll be pretty good. So, all right, I'm gonna end this video. I went a little bit over an hour, uh, but like I said, story is a big one, and I didn't get to cover everything. I just kind of give you the basics. Um, like I said, if you got questions on things that I didn't mention, and there's certain things that are kind of eating at you, you kind of want to see if I have any insight on it. Just go ahead and message me, you know, or put it in the comments, and I'll read it. Um, I'm sure I'll get, you know, manhandled in the comments too. People talking about, um, like, oh man, the way you do it's crazy, you know, or blah blah blah. But it's been working for me, you know. Sure, if I did it, if I had a better way of doing it, I don't know if that would be would make, you know, even if I did things what everybody considers correct, would that equal more money? Maybe. I would think, I would think, but that's not always the case. Like I said, it's a, it's a gamble. It's a crapshoot, really. I mean, you got to put in the time, put in the effort, and you got to take a chance. And you'll, you'll never know until you try, and you won't ever get it. You won't ever succeed unless you take a chance. You know, roll the dice, see what happens, um, and uh, and give it your best shot. Like I said, and uh, the, I think also. None of this stuff, as you can tell, I'm using old books, and I've listened to my friends, I've listened to other artists, I've listened to other writers, I've listened to people tell me how I should do things, and I've taken all of it with a grain of salt, but you know what, at the end of the day, I've, I've, you know, I've listened to things here and there, but at the end of the day, I think I've, uh, fend for myself. It's, it's all about how you can, 
um, you, you know, you got to rely on your own uh, whatever creativity, real obviously creativity, but you also got to learn on your own t tenacity, your own uh, resourcefulness, how well you can critically think and solve problems. Um, all of it is how you know your resolve, your overall resolve, and how you can uh, how you uh, you know deal with it. And uh, that's all you can really go on, really. I mean, like I said, you can do things exactly like I do them. It might not work for you. Um, you might come up to situations that I'd never come up against. You know, you just got to learn how to, just like Rocky said, you know. doesn't matter how many times you get knocked down. You just got to keep getting back up. Um, you know, Todd McFarlane, how many rejection letters did he get until he finally got his big break? All of these cliches that people say, you know, it's all true. I mean, it's. It's, you know, it sounds like a cliche, but I mean, it's true. It just, you got to just keep, you just keep pounding on it. And eventually, uh, hopefully, you know, you have a good chance of succeeding. So just keep, stay at it, keep at it, keep working towards your goal. And uh, you'll eventually get there, hopefully. Um, I'm still working at it, so. All right, I'm going to end this video. Uh, probably the next one I'm going to start is probably going to do breakdowns. Um, and layouts and how I break down a script and how I break down or just break down a story idea. I'll probably do that next. Um, but, uh, oops. So, yeah. So, that'll be my next one. I might do some other, sorry. Picked a scab on my chin. Now it's bleeding. Um, uh, that'll probably be the next video in the series I do. I'll probably do other videos here and there, like I did the comic one on the facsimile comics just in between this. I was going to do this linear, but again, it's just like committing to a storyline. You might not want to do 20 pages of one story. You might want to hit it with a couple of pages and then switch to a new story. Same thing with this. I'm going to hit you with this series. It's ongoing, but I'm going to do it probably a piece here and a piece there. So eventually you'll, you'll get the whole broad pack, you know, the whole, the whole uh, whatever, enchilada, wherever it is. All right, I'm going to let you go. My voice is starting to crack a little bit. Uh, I'll see you on the next one. All right, bye-bye.